Well, welcome all of you. Um, probably most of you saw my pre-announcement that I did in the keynote, so I want to give you a little bit more details around that. And sorry for this very boring title, but we wanted to give things away as, last, as late as possible. So if you had asked me five, seven years ago, what's the future of server? My answer would have been quite predictable, quite boring in fact. Right? We knew the major players, we knew the technologies, and we knew the trends that those technologies are on. Now fast forward to today, everything has changed. Right? Where there used to be high performance, high density silicon was only available to a few companies, now it has been completely commoditized. And that's because of the slowdown of, or the economic slowdown of Moore's Law and the tremendous scale of the high-end cell phone market. And as a result of it, many fabless chip companies now have access to that high-performance silicon. And we see that, and I refer to that this morning as we're seeing this Cambrian explosion of servers. A good example of that actually is Qualcomm, right? So Qualcomm is building its 10 nanometer server part and they do that based on the fact that they're a mobile phone powerhouse. And others are following suit too. Uh, look at the entry that AMD is doing. Look at what Cavium is doing. The other thing that's interesting too is the scale of the cloud. So we're running so many properties with such many machines associated with them, hundreds of thousands per property easily, that it becomes economically feasible to go and optimize the hardware against that particular property, even if that means changing the instruction set. So what we announced this morning was that we are driving innovation with ARM 64-bit uh, servers in our data center. And specifically, we've been working with multiple ARM server vendors, including Cavium and Qualcomm, on optimizing their parts for our data center needs. And not just their current generation parts that are out this year, also the parts beyond that, and also the parts beyond that. So these are long-term kind of relationships. We've also, as part of our software enablement stack, and I'll talk about a little bit more, brought up Windows. And that's because that's a foundational part of our infrastructure. But given where we see the market going, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about that too, this is all for internal use. We don't see any opportunity at this point for Windows Server outside our internal applications. And then in order to drive the adoption or really the integration of these ARM servers into our data centers, we've tied it very closely with Project Olympus. So we've worked with Cavium and Qualcomm on Project Olympus compatible motherboards that slide into our chassis and as a result of it, I don't have to worry about have to figure out how to do out-of-band out management for these things or figure out how to deal with the power supply or any other kind of data center standard that we have. All of that comes with Project Olympus. So why ARM? So there's three main reasons for that. The first one is we're actually seeing an innovative ecosystem with multiple players. The multiple player part is very important to us because we believe that competition will actually increase the innovation. And when I look at the long-term roadmaps of all my partners, that's exactly what's happening. Um, the other one that is very important is about an existing ecosystem. And I want to remind everybody of how did x86 servers become big? Well, there was a whole development, there was a whole a PC ecosystem with lots of developers and lots of tools, and that really propelled uh, x86 servers. ARM has a similar thing going for it. It's on the mobile space, but there too, the tools exist, the operating systems exist, and it certainly applies to us. So in our port of Windows Server to ARM64 hardware, we basically reused what we did on the client. We tend to have within Microsoft something that we call one core, which is a common source code base that everything gets built out of, Windows Server, Server Core, the client parts, and so on. So it greatly sped up the port. So, and the third reason is a little bit more subtle. So we feel that ARM is very well positioned for future instruction set enhancements. And with that, I'm not talking about the next generation vector extension that's relatively straightforward. But as we're running out of steam, 
um, with out of order execution, people have started looking at data flow execution. I know kind of an idea back from the 60s, but stuff that sort of makes sense that sort of propels us unto the next level. Now in the ARM ecosystem, instruction sets are orthogonal. Right? I jokingly refer to your 32, ARM's 32-bit instruction set and 64-bit instruction set have one thing in common, and that's the name. Right? It's its own opcode set, its own set of instructions. And so it's very easy to imagine that you can create another orthogonal instruction set that is optimized for data flow without breaking the rest of the software ecosystem and the hardware ecosystem that ARM has built over time. The other thing I want to clear up is that we've, we've seen ARM has made a lot of noise about servers. And the first generation servers that we saw, while interesting, didn't really meet our performance needs. Right? For my workloads, I need high single threat performance. And I like a lot of threats. So that's what we're seeing now. The generation that's coming out this year will actually have all of those properties. Now the difficulty that I have is that I cannot disclose to you what the speed and feats are of those. I am under strict NDAs with my partners. But I'll have some of them on stage and hopefully they'll tell a little bit more. <laughs> okay, so I already talked about the performance and the capabilities, the TCO story. They have changed significantly. What we're seeing today are ARM servers that have hyper-threat performance, so high IPC, they have lots of threats in cores, um, and they have, uh, <coughs> sorry, they have very interesting connectivity options, especially going forward if you look at all the new bus architectures that are being uh, developed uh, and attached at interesting accelerators, interesting NICs, all sorts of interesting functions are being developed there. We're also seeing interesting integration options. So standard components that are typically onboard devices are being moved in the SOC. And that's basically a bill of material reduction, which is also interesting to us. So the other thing, too, is some of you will probably remember we did this experiment uh, about 10 years ago, about 16 years ago, uh, with Itanium. And the challenge, obviously, was how do you move so much code from that x86 ecosystem. Back then, now to today, the world is completely different. Most of our code today is actually written in managed runtime systems. Things like CLR, Common Language Runtime, which for us is the underpinning for C Sharp and all of that, which is what we and Microsoft might write most of our programs in. That is by definition architecture independent. Um, the same applies to Java. A lot of stuff is written in Java. There are just-in-time compilers that will translate that on the fly. So the code dependency, the native code dependency, has become a lot less. The other thing, too, is by just supporting our internal cloud, um, my validation matrix is considerably shorter. I don't have to support, I don't know, sound cards or fax drivers or umpteen NIC drivers. I only have a few of those. Right? The number of peripheral cards that I have is very limited. So again, the whole scope reduces quite considerably. Let me talk a little bit about where we see the value. So as I said this morning, right, we're not planning to move our entire software ecosystem over. That doesn't make much sense. It is about where we see value. And we see value in a class of applications that are referred to as cloud services. So these are search and indexing, right? A big proportion of our data center is devoted to that. This is high performance storage. This is machine learning and big data. Again, this is where we see these throughput devices, which ARM servers really are, play out very well. Obviously, you got web services, you got databases. Um, email potentially, anything that has a platform as a service that really abstracts it away from that ISA is a good candidate for ARM, or at least the machines that we're seeing. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about what we don't see as opportunities. So VM hosting, we don't see as an opportunity. Right? Why not? Not because the capabilities don't exist in ARM, but it's just that the VMs that you would want to move there, right? Uh, are by definition from the enterprise space, which is x86. X right? So we don't see a lot of opportunities around there. We don't see a lot of opportunities around enterprise either, 
And that's in part because the enterprise isn't really growing um, and disrupting a stable market is actually quite challenging. And the last one is an obvious one is legacy applications. So those are sort of the spaces that we don't see much opportunity for ARM servers. Hence our decision also to keep Windows Server internal for now. So what did we do? So as I said, we focused very much at the applications we wanted to port and then the software stack that we need in order to port those applications. And so Windows Server Core, Windows Server is an important part of that, specifically the core version. Windows Server Core is a cloud-optimized version of, uh, of Windows. Um, so we ported that, and as I said, we greatly benefited from, uh, from all the stuff that we did on the client space. We obviously ported language runtime systems, .NET Core, uh, a whole bunch of other tools and languages, compilers, all that kind of stuff that came with it. Um, and then, of course, we ported a set of internal cloud services workloads. And you can actually see one on the floor here, both on, in the Cavium booth and in the Microsoft booth, where we're showing off the Qualcomm uh, platforms. We're actually running a real Bing AI indexing algorithm, um, but with a fake data set, by the way, so don't worry about that. So ARM is all about an open ecosystem. And in part of why we're doing this announcement here is so we can actually participate more openly in that. Because we are interested in advancing ARM servers for general purpose data center use. And so here's a list of companies that we've worked with. We've obviously worked closely with ARM anywhere from ISA extensions to data center standards and stuff like that. We've obviously been working with Cavium and Qualcomm. I already mentioned them. Interesting detail, by the way, here, because standardization is so incredibly key to make an ARM server ecosystem happen with multiple players. We're actually running the same version of Windows on all these different platforms. There's not a single line of code different. Um, we have ODMs involved with this. We obviously have NIC partners involved in this, and this list is not complete. Um, so the partnerships is all about open standards. Part of it is working with uh, specifications on them, on how we build things for the data center. Project Olympus is part of that, but it's also about interface standards, ACPI definitions, all that kind of low-level stuff that you need to run an operating system reliably. Um, and as I point out here on the slide, this is at all levels, right? So it's not just the chassis definitions that we're very concerned about here at OCP. It is the firmware, it is the OS and then going up. So I can talk a lot about partners, but who better to do that than actually the partners themselves? So I'd like to invite Ram from Qualcomm up here and talk a little bit about their Centric 2400. Great. Really good to see you, Linder. Hey, Ram, good to see you. Yeah. An exciting day. Yeah, so it's been, actually the news has been very good and the uptake has been very good Absolutely. from what I can Brilliant. tell. Yes. So yeah. So what makes the Centric 2400 so compelling for Microsoft? Yeah. I think there are a few elements here. Um, first, as you said, Leander, there is a structural shift that's happening in the semiconductor process technology. Historically, leading nodes were driven by PC volumes, but they are now driven by mobile volumes, and that puts Qualcomm in a very unique position. Given our mobile footprint, we have access to the leading edge nodes, and we are now bringing that to the data centers. By leading the industry to the next generation 10 nanometer process node, we think we are fundamentally reshaping the data center landscape. Qualcomm Centric 2400 is the world's first 10 nanometer server processor, and it's really engineered ground up for cloud workloads to provide high performance and power efficiency. Now, the second step, we took that one step further, and we really worked together between Qualcomm and Microsoft to design their server specification so this is the open compute motherboard that makes it easy for deployment of the Qualcomm Centric 2400 uh, processor. So we're bringing the 10 nanometer server processor to the industry and we're making it easy to be deployed through the first 10 nanometer open compute motherboard submission. The third element, it is also fully compliant with Project Olympus, so it enables Microsoft to take advantage of it very easily in a very seamless, frictionless manner. Uh, and lastly, we are contributing to, to OCP so that the community can uh, 
uh, adopted and innovate around it. So kind of to pull it all together, we're bringing the world's first 10 nanometer servers to the market. We're enabling its deployment through open compute motherboard that is Project Olympus compliant. And we're contributing it to the OCP community so that we can all innovate around the 10 nanometer processor. Good. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, so that is very exciting. And I actually liked seeing all those different platforms coming together in yep. Project Olympus. Now, sure. as you know, between our two companies, we've been spending working a lot together, yes. right? So what are some of sort of the unique things that we've been working on and what uniquely differentiate our relationship? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I think there are multiple things that go into it. Um, it. The very first thing is Qualcomm and Microsoft have a very long history of collaboration. This is a corporate collaboration that spans across the full spectrum of computing. Um, last year, as many of you may know, we have announced Windows 10 on Snapdragon. That is a result of our collaboration on the client side. And what we are talking today is our collaboration on the server side, which is also another key pillar in what the two companies do together. Now, when you look within servers, um, really all collaboration starts with deep engineering engagement. So we have engineering teams that work very closely together. We have a very close interlock. We actually have engineers from Qualcomm who are on site at Microsoft who are part of the team. So it's a very, very kind of high functioning, close collaboration. Uh, and that has both near term and longer term uh, objectives for us. The near term objectives are, as Leonard, you just talked about, really getting the Microsoft cloud services to be ported and optimized hardware software together for internal use at Microsoft. But their longer term collaboration, we are looking at key technology areas, like in memory, like in acceleration, that shape the data center of the future. Now, the last point I want to make there is we also are collaborating on all areas of the system stack. So it starts with collaborating on the board, like this Project Olympus compliant board submission. But it goes up to the foundational software in terms of firmware, Windows Server operating system, compilers, as well as runtimes like Core CLR, and then to the applications and cloud services. Uh, and what we're also doing is bring, try, bringing on on-the-fly binary translation of x86 applications on top of Qualcomm-centric 2400 processor. And this is really to address the long tail of applications that may not be ported in the near term. So if I were to pull this together, we have a really deep engineering collaboration that has a near-term goal of enabling Microsoft cloud services and a long-term goal of reshaping the future of the data center. Excellent. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, but obviously, we've been working with more partners. So I would also like to invite Syed on stage, the CEO of Caviar. So. Hey, Syed. Great to be here. I saw your, uh, your, your demo in your booth. Very impressive. Thank you. So, for you, the same question. What makes your offering so compelling for Microsoft? Sure. So, I'd just like to make a couple points. The first is that Cavium has been in the ARM server market now for roughly three years, uh, and we have been shipping dual socket ARM servers uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, they have an installed base in quite a few of data centers around the world. But what differentiates our Thunder X2 offering is this is what we call the world's first dual socket ARM server, which has single core performance and per socket performance that is competitive with higher end x86 servers. Uh, so if you look at the previous generations of ARM servers, uh, the single core performance or the per socket used to be substantially lower. So they could only address a, a very tiny fraction of the workloads that are out there. But with the new offerings uh, uh, that are there from us and from Qualcomm, uh, we believe that uh, this will be able to address a fairly significant portion of the market. Good, yes. As I said, very impressive to see that working. So. Different question for you. So we know that ARM, you already referred to, right, initially had lower performance parts. Um, and that ecosystem has taken a long time to really materialize, right? So what does the Microsoft announcement that we made this morning mean for that ARM ecosystem? Sure. So we've been working with Microsoft now for roughly two years, starting, starting off with the Thunder X1, our, our first generation processor. So it's been a long process, but that has really helped us to, to, uh, uh, for the X2 itself to be able to kind of get to market very, very quickly. So the Microsoft uh, uh, endorsement, if you will, uh, is, I think, a defining moment in the, ARM server, uh, 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 in the ARM server history, if you will, right? 
So um, we think that this endorsement uh, will significantly accelerate other ecosystem partners uh, to, join, uh, to join the ARM Server Alliance, for one. And secondly, also, other vendors uh, or other uh, end cloud customers or uh, both from the private clouds and, and public clouds uh, to be able to, uh, 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 to, to, adopt, uh, 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 to adopt these servers in production uh, with, with confidence, right? So, so I think this is really a, a huge defining moment uh, and the huge you can spell with Y-U-G-E, right? a la Trump, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, this is really a, a, a great thing, and I think this will really start a, a kind of a, a tsunami effect, if you will, uh, in the whole ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Very much appreciate having you here. So yeah, so to wrap this up, we're very excited about what we're seeing from our partners in the ARM ecosystem and the capabilities that they'll come out with this year, but also the ones beyond that and the ones beyond that. We've been working closely with them on that. And as I said, we've been running evaluations of their products that are coming out this year, and the value proposition we're seeing is very compelling. Compelling enough for us to start moving our workloads to that and running those in evaluation. We've also been working closely with the community. As I said, one of the things we're doing this within OCP is obviously to enable ARM servers and accelerate them for general purpose data center use. So with that, I am going to be here for the next couple, two days, so feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much.